Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the TOPO program and the Constitutional Studies program. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, this morning's event. Uh, and to introduce our speaker, I'm going to call to the podium Jack Ferguson. Uh, Jack is a junior here at Notre Dame, one of our TOPO fellows. And his best friend happens to be our speaker's uh, son. So, Jack. <coughs> Uh, Arthur Brooks is the president of American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and today you will doubtless hear of his fine work, a blend of economics, social entrepreneurship, um, and with a touch of moral philosophy. But I am blessed to know Dr. Brooks first and foremost um, for some of his even more important work uh, in his capacity as a family man. Um, I'm lucky enough to have lived down the street from the Brooks family for the last eight years. Um, so growing up, I only knew him as the father of one of my friends, um, and I had no idea of his secret other life as a New York Times bestselling author and world-famous scholar. Um, Dr. Brooks's life story is quite an interesting one. He often alludes to it in his speeches, so I won't steal all of his thunder. But Google lists him as a classical musician, which is technically true if you're aware of the 12 years he spent as a French hornist after high school. He did eventually go back to college, um, ultimately obtained his PhD in economics, and began teaching public policy at Syracuse University. In 2009, he began serving as president of AEI, one of DC's most respected think tanks. Uh, and he's published a number of books, including his signature work, The Conservative Heart. His scholarship, writing, and speaking engagements beautifully synthesize hard economic data and moral wisdom as he fights for families, free enterprise, and human flourishing. He's announced this summer he'll be stepping down as the president of AEI and will join the faculty of Harvard as a professor of public leadership. But he probably secretly wishes he could teach here at Notre Dame, which is why he's here today to speak to us on bringing America together. So please welcome Arthur Brooks. Thank you, Jack. And uh, thanks to all of you. What a joy it is to be here at Notre Dame. Um, I love this place. It is true. We all, all of us who are serious about our Catholic faith wish that we were here. Um, and I know that all of you understand, I mean, you have this kind of funny chauvinism here at, at Notre Dame. You think that anybody who didn't go to Notre Dame is uh, deprived. And so for all, on, on behalf of all the rest of us, I want you to know that I agree. Um, uh, Jack Ferguson is, is, is indeed my son Joaquin's best friend. They went to, they went to high school together at a place called The Heights in Potomac, Maryland. Uh, and they, they went their separate ways. I was kind of hoping they could go to college together. But they see each other on breaks, and, and I get to see him when he's home. And, and we are dear friends of their families. I also see Joe Nolan, a great friend of, a great friend of our family. Uh, so we have a, a, a Potomac, Maryland contingent here. Um, what, a, what an honor it is to speak at Notre Dame in this great program. Uh, Professor Munoz has been doing fantastic work that's getting national attention at the same time that the, this university is rising in its elite status. The question is for any great university is how can we answer the biggest questions of the day? I mean, why do great universities exist to crank out more students with bachelor's degrees and, and graduate degrees? No. The idea of a factory of ideas, of a, a, a ferment, a laboratory with a competition of ideas, is, is to solve problems with ideas, isn't it? That's why we're all together blending, kind of wiring our intellectual batteries together. And, and that's what I want to talk about here today. Um, I want to talk to you today about how to solve the biggest problems, the oldest problems, with new ideas. Okay, now, now I'm, a, I'm president of this think tank in DC. The American Enterprise Institute, where I serve as president, um, has been around for 80 years. Uh, the place is dedicated to solving big public policy problems. But let me tell you the central insight in running a think tank. When you have a big problem and you don't know the solution, the answer is never to think harder in the old way, in the conventional way, in the way that everybody's thinking. It's not the right way to do it. Why? Because everybody's doing that. Why, need, why do you need Notre Dame or the American Enterprise Institute or any other idea institution if you can get everybody in the world thinking in the old ways about old problems? You need to think differently about old problems. That's the solution. Patrick Deneen is here. He does this. He thinks about things in my area in different ways, in different ways than I think about it. That's why it's important. OK, so what I'm going to propose to you, and by the way, this is true in everything, in business, 
This is true in family life. I was just thinking about this um, one example about thinking in a new way and it opening it up new vistas, just in ordinary problems. I've got, I've got three kids. They're 20 and 18 and 15, one left at home. And my 18-year-old graduated um, last spring. And you know, all throughout high school, as a typical high school kid, you know, we would be in and out of the the, the headmaster's office, and we were in for this parent-teacher conference, and it was going very poorly. It was a like this grades issue. He's not living up to his potential, and I don't know if he's going to pass this class or what. Anyways, anguish for me and my wife, <laughs> which is just the way it is. And so that was some of you, by the way, and I hope that you've apologized to your parents since then. Um, and, and we were in the car after this thing, and it was this old problem, this, pro this old problem, again and again. I said, I don't know how we're going to solve this. My wife, who's from Barcelona, and she's uh, an optimist. She's sunny. She's Spanish. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, and she says, I think we need to think about this old problem in a completely new way. And I said, I'm all ears. <laughs> She said, at least we know he's not cheating. <clears throat> <laughs> so that's the spirit in which I want to take on two big problems in this country. And I, you know, we all differ in here with respect to our ideology. We all differ with respect to our politics. Some of you are on the left, and some of you are on the right, and some of you are nowhere, don't know. It's fine. I want to tell you a couple of things that we're all, I think we're all going to agree are big problems in this country and where we're not finding solutions. And I want to offer to you an epiphany in each one of these things that I've had and see whether we can make some progress in thinking in a new way. The first is what I believe is the biggest public policy problem facing America. And the second is the biggest political problem facing America. So I'm going to save the controversial stuff for the second half. And this is based, this thinking is based on a new book that I'm just finishing up. I'm just, it's late and my editor is stressed out and he's calling every day, right? So you're helping me work through a bunch of these ideas and I appreciate that. This book will be coming out in March. It's called Love Your Enemies and you're going to see why. So let's get started. What's the biggest public policy problem facing America? Here's my candidate. Our biggest problem is the way that we treat people at the margins of our society. Okay? Now, our biggest problem is not economic growth. Our biggest problem is not our tax system. Our biggest problem is not the conduct of our economy or foreign policy. Those are issues. Those are important. But my view as a Catholic, and my view as an economist, and my view as an American, is that the biggest problem that we have is the way that we treat people at the periphery of our society in America today, and indeed around the world. Okay? I told you it wasn't, that's not very controversial. I bet a lot of you agree with me. So why can't we solve that? Answer, in my view, is because we try to keep thinking about it in the old way again and again and again. You know, we have this, this funny system of, of the way that we dole out government benefits, the way that we organize our economy, the way that we, we think about work. It's not working for people in the bottom 30 or 40 percent of our economic distribution. So how do we think about this differently? What's the epiphany that can help us think differently about that? One of the things that I've noticed is when I'm working on something like this, I'm working on a new book or whatever, I'll be trolling for the outside idea. So I'll put myself, I'll listen to music that I'm not familiar with, or I'll, I'll, I'll read books I'm not I don't traditionally read. I'll go talk to people that I've never met. Why? Because I'm looking for a stimulus. You want to get outside your bubble if you want an epiphany, if you want to think about things in new ways. You need new stimulus. So at the time that I was trying to crack this, I was listening to, uh, I was listening to a, 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 believe it or not, a fundraising pitch from, um, <clears throat> from the cardinal, uh, the former cardinal of Chicago, Cardinal Francis George. Now, he died three, three, four years ago. Um, he died prematurely. He died of cancer, and it was tragic. Um, but his words live on. He was the, arguably the, the, the leading intellectual in the American church. Not everybody agreed with him. Not everybody liked him. But everybody respected his intellectual abilities. 
And okay, so I'm listening to a fundraising pitch. I, that's what I do for a living mostly. I mean, I'm chief executive of a, of a think tank that has to raise $50 million a year and where I pay 300 people's rents and mortgages. So this is like a lot of pressure. I'm always trying to raise money, just like the people who run this university. It's always in the hunt, tin cup, going all the time. So Cardinal George was a great fundraiser. He was a prodigious, he could get money to give for anything, practically. So I'm looking for his tips, to be quite frank with you. I'm trying to learn from the master. And, and, and he's talking to his wealthiest donors on the North Shore of Chicago, billionaires. He's asking them to give money to his poverty programs on the south side of Chicago. And here's what he said, okay? Some of you have probably heard this because it, it, it wound up being kind of a famous story. Here's what Cardinal George said to his wealthiest donors. He started out kind of conventionally. He said, the poor, they need you to pull them out of poverty. Then he said, and you need the poor to keep you out of hell. <laughs> Gutsy move, your eminence. Right? I mean, I'm not going to use that to fundraise for my think tank. <laughs> but here's the epiphany. Here's the epiphany. I understand the theological significance. I understand the point that he's trying to make. Here's where it changed my thinking. I was thinking about that later. I was amused by that sort of. But I asked myself, do we, do we need the poor? I mean, I understand morally that we do. But, but ask yourself this. Every, everybody here in this room comes from a community that has people in poverty in that community. How long would it take you in your home community if all of the people under the poverty level suddenly disappeared? How long would it take you to know? How long would it take your social life to change? How long would it take to impact your life in a meaningful, moral way? I dare say, too long. <laughs> because we've come apart as a country. Because we don't, in a very effective way, need each other. See where I'm going with this, right? I mean, Cardinal George is making a slightly different point. But it's occurring to me that I'm not sure that my life reflects my Christian viewpoint that I need everybody, including the poor. So I was thinking about this a little bit more, and I, and I was thinking how weirdly ahistoric this is by American standards. Why? Because this is a country built by the poor. It wasn't not by the exploitation of the poor. On the contrary, look, I look around this room, and, and I look back in your family histories. Look at the Nolan family, three generations ago, scratching up potatoes in some godforsaken county in Ireland. Look at them now, scratching up potatoes. Anyway, that's different. They, <clears throat> um, what I see when I look around this room is a hundred different life stories and, and family histories. Some were poor and agricultural, and some were probably running from some tyrant someplace, and maybe some of your ancestors were brought to this country involuntarily. I don't know. But here's what we all have in common. Here's what we have in common. We all descend from ambitious riffraff, and we're proud of it. See, this is, by the way, the American Catholic distinction, too, is this pride in coming from the outsiders, and building something good and beautiful and meaningful and true. Think where we're sitting. It's one of the great universities in America. It was a university built for people who were not allowed in polite society. Think how significant that is. This is emblematic of what the world needs and what America means. The only country in the world where we're proud of being the descendants of riffraff. Now, how has that changed? Well, a lot, I dare say. We don't think about that. We don't think about where we came from quite so much. And we don't have relationships with the new generation of people who look an awful lot like our great grandparents did. Don't we? You know, it's funny. I think I know that, I think I know when America changed, when we became so class-based that we became cut off from the people that remind us of our grandparents. Because there is a new generation, by the way. We could, if we were doing a big public event that was catered and people were serving us, every single one of the people serving us practically would be an immigrant. And they would be just like our grandparents. 
And we should be proud of them because they chose our country just like your grandparents chose our country. Okay. So when did that change that we got cut off, that we didn't sort of need people at the periphery of society in the same way? I think I've got a date for you. Okay, and this is, this is artificial, but bear with me. I think it was April 24th, 1963. Okay, what happened? That was the date that President Lyndon Johnson, uh, he declared his war on poverty. He went to a little tent, and by the way, President Johnson, I mean, people talk about how great modern presidents are manipulating the press and getting, you know, getting cameras on them. None of, those, none of these current presidents says anything on President Johnson. President Johnson was the master of PR. I mean, it's unbelievable. He puts these new guys to shame. President Johnson, in April of 1963, he goes to a little town in, the, in Appalachia. It's called Inez, Kentucky, in Martin County, Kentucky, in eastern Kentucky, coal country. It was one of the poorest places in America. Nobody had ever heard of it. You haven't heard of it. Most of you haven't. They hadn't heard of it then either. And just as it is poor today, it was poor then. Here's what Johnson did. He takes a bunch of reporters from Time Magazine and a bunch of photographers from Life Magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, and he took them down to Inez, Kentucky, and, and here's what he does. He picks out a random guy and goes up on his porch and asks him his life story. Click, click, click all these. You can look it up, you can Google it, and you can find this picture of Lyndon Johnson on this guy, his name is Tom Fletcher. It's a tar paper shack. And he's down in his haunches because Lyndon Johnson was like 6'5", and, and Tommy Fletcher is this little wiry guy. So he's down in his haunches saying, tell me your story. And Tom Fletcher tells him a story of he's 38 years old, he's illiterate, he's a father of eight, he has a first grade education, he hasn't worked in five years, he's got no future, he's got no hope, and his kids don't have either of those things either. Hmm. So he hears the story, he stands up and he walks off the porch and he says to all the reporters president, present, Today, I declare a war on poverty. Our goal is total victory. And you would have cheered. You would have agreed with every word. He gets back to Washington, and he, um, he puts a general in charge of the war on poverty, uh, a guy named Sergeant Shriver, who had set up the Peace Corps, a great American who loves this country. He was JFK's brother-in-law. And, J and, and Sergeant Schreiber was asked, what is the objective of the war on poverty? And he said, I quote, three words, dignity, not doles. You agree with that. I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what my politics are. You agree in dignity, not doles. Nobody says, yeah, dignity, it's kind of overrated. I'll take doles. Nobody. And yet, what has happened since that time? What has happened in the... $23 trillion we have spent in the war on poverty. We have gone from 14% of Americans below the poverty line in 1965 to 13% in poverty today. That's failure in any industry besides government. And that's a problem that you should join me in regretting. We've been looking at an old problem and trying to solve an old problem in an old and conventional way. Now again, I'm not militating against a poverty program or against the safety net. Those things are, in my view, the greatest achievement of the free enterprise system is being able to do that. The problem is how we do it. See, this gets back to Cardinal George. Do you need the poor? Our country, since the mid-1960s, has gone from needing poor people to helping poor people. I want to help people. So do you. Helping people is great. But what happens when you become a charity case? Like, I got these three kids. They are completely unproductive. They are charity cases, right? 60% of my family is unemployed. Think about that, right? What a bunch of takers. Seriously, right? How do you think I treat them? Like charity cases? Oh, no. no. That's not how I treat my kids, because that would be a form of exquisite child abuse. I treat my kids not like liabilities to manage, which is, by the way, how our welfare state treats poor people in this country, as liabilities to manage. I treat my kids as assets to develop. Like I run a company, right? I got liabilities and I got assets. 
Liabilities are something that you can't get rid of immediately, but you manage them until you can get them off your balance sheet. Assets are usually more expensive than liabilities, but you're pumping resources into them because that's your future, is your assets. When did we go from seeing poor people as assets and started seeing them as liabilities? These are our brothers and sisters. You don't do that to the people that you love. Okay, back to Cardinal George. What's the solution? Helping them more? No. Helping is great. Needing them more. Now, it's funny, you know, when, um, when Pope Francis in 2013 was in, was, or 2014, whenever it was when he was in the United States, in his first American tour, um, and he was in, in Washington, D.C., he was giving a, a speech, actually, he was giving a, uh, uh, celebrating a mass at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington, and, and in the congregation were bishops, all the American bishops, you know, ordinary, unimportant lay people, us, we couldn't get in. It was bishops, right? And, okay, and it was just like the elite of the church, the elite. And Pope Francis, he got out a big stick during that mass, and he said in his homily to his brother bishops, you shepherds need to smell like the sheep, right? And I thought, yeah, man, that's what's wrong with the church. They're, they're, they're bureaucratic and they're elite and they're far away from us. And yeah, they need to smell more like me, sheep like me. And then I thought, huh, actually I'm a bishop too. I mean, I'm not a church bishop, but I run a company. I run an institution. I'm in a leadership position. How much do I smell like the sheep? I do work on poverty. I run an institution dedicated to people with less power than we have. To what extent do I know the people who are the beneficiaries of the policies that I'm promoting? I changed my approach. The Pope changed my approach. I started to go to organizations and talk to people that were really gonna be affected by the policies that the scholars at my institution were talking about. And, and over the course of doing that, I was at a homeless shelter in New York City, a wonderful place called the Doe Fund that has miraculous results of, of people in this homeless shelter having high work uptake and, and reintegrating in society. And these are the hardest cases. They're men who've been in prison, almost all of them. They're almost all drug and alcohol addicted. Uh, they were in for major crimes. They've abandoned their families. I mean, these aren't just the traditionally unloved members of society. These are the members of society that we consider to be unlovable, right? Which is harder, <laughs> a test of our moral worth. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to these guys and they're giving me their amazing life stories. And this one guy, his name is Richard Norat. He had just gone out of prison after 22 years. He killed a guy when he was 18 and went to prison for life. And through the grace of the New York penal system, he gets out. And, and he's at this, he has no place to go. He's in this homeless shelter. And he get, the, the secret to this homeless shelter's success is, is work. Work brings purpose. Work brings meaning everybody's got to work. So this guy gets a job uh, killing bugs for minimum wage, an exterminator agency. He's nine months out of prison. And I said, I didn't know what to say because, you know, I'm just, I, I don't even know how to start an interview with this guy. I mean, his life story is so amazing to me. I said, Rick, so how's your life? And he said, let me show you. Takes out his iPhone, first one he's ever had. And he's got, shows me an email from his boss that says, hey, Rick, I have an emergency bed bug job on East 65th Street. I need you now. And I said, so what? He says, read it again. He said, I need you now. That is the first time in my life anybody has said those words to me. Think about it. Think about it, your life. The center of your dignity is not being helped. Your dignity comes because you are needed by somebody else by your kids, by your family, by your employer, and in a meta sense, by the economy. Here is the central organizing idea. Here is the inflecting thought that I offer to you. If we want to serve our brothers and sisters at the margins of our society better, we must move from help to need. Any public policy that makes people less necessary is a bad policy. Any policy that makes people more needed is a better policy. It doesn't make it a perfect policy, but it's a better policy. Are you promoting policies that make people less needed, yes or no? That's changed my work, and I offer it to you. That's idea number one. Idea number two, what's the biggest problem in politics? Now that we're all warmed up, 
let's make it a little bit more controversial. What's the biggest problem in politics and what's the new way of thinking about it? <clears throat> you know, and this is really what my next book is about. So you tell me what you think. Um, when we were in the run-up to the 2016 election, I know you're going to have you know, the, you know, the Trump presidency and debates about all that. You know, most college campuses are not a big diversity of viewpoints about, um, you know, politics. Um, I'm going to Harvard, and, you know, I think at Harvard, my new employer, uh, the, the debate about the Trump presidency would be, you know, Trump at two years, disaster or apocalypse. You know, it would be, <clears throat> it's, um, there's just not a lot of different points of view at most universities. I get it. I get it. It's fine. That's fine, as long as there's a competition and nothing gets shut down, nobody gets run out of town, it's no problem. But let me tell you what I think is the big problem in our politics. And that's how we talk to each other. How people talk to each other. I, I know that sounds trite, but bear with me for a second. You know, in, in the run-up to the, the, the 2016 election, uh, we were, I was watching a debate with my daughter, uh, who at the time was 14, and, and, and I remember saying, to her, remember, the way that those two people are talking to each other does not reflect our values. I was talking about the two candidates for President of the United States, and I couldn't decide whose rhetoric I liked less. That's hugely problematic. That's morally problematic. That has coarsening our culture, the way that we talk to each other. And I think it's avoidable, but only avoidable if we find an inflecting way of getting out of this problem. Now, to begin with, why, why, do I, why do I hate it? Why do I hate it? Number one, it's extremely unproductive. And uh, it's not, I mean, th th that was teach us. I mean, Philip is the, uh, is the political scientist or the political philosopher here. But they say that politics is supposed to be the art of persuasion, right? Nobody in the history of humanity has ever been persuaded by being insulted. You can't insult people into agreement, which is to say that our politics isn't very effective today. Second, it's morally problematic. And this is really where the, you know, the epiphany experience comes in for me. Um, in, a couple of years ago, as we were running up to this whole you know, train wreck of American politics today, um, I was giving a lecture. I mean, I do like 175 talks a year. Um, it's, my, it's my job. It's great. Beats working, as they say. And um, I was in a, sometimes I do really, really left-wing audiences at universities, and sometimes I do really, really right-wing audiences, you know, activist groups, whatever. I speak to everybody because it's fun and it's good. <laughs> and I try to think, talk about things that are nutritious and wholesome and that people can agree on. And so I was at a, an activist conference in New Hampshire, a conservative activist conference. I mean, this was like 600 fired up activists, like three-cornered hats, the whole deal. And I was the only non-presidential candidate on the docket. <clears throat> so there's people that were going to run for president and that wanted to get the nomination. So it's like, I think the end of 14 when I was doing this. It was you know, Ted Cruz and Scott Walker and, and you know, Donald Trump was there. And I'm like, ah, he'll never get that. What are you talking about? Right? The joke was on me. It shows you what I know about politics. Anyway, so I'm, you know, I, I'm thinking as I'm backstage, because these candidates, they're just throwing stakes out into the audience, just one after the other, getting applause lines, and these liberals, you know, stuff like that. And look, I'm a political conservative, right? I agree with what most of the people in that audience probably think about economics and national security, et cetera, et cetera. But I was thinking to myself, I sing a little prayer, what's my job here? My job here is to make people a little better, right? Doesn't matter where I am, if I have the privilege of speaking in front of an audience, my job is to make people a little bit better, if I can. So I thought, what am I going to do to say that? And so in the, in my, get up and I'm giving my talk. In the middle of the talk, I say, now, I want you to remember, as we make arguments about economics and national security and social policy, I want you to remember all of the people who are not here because they don't agree with us. And I'm talking about political progressives. And I want you to remember my friends, that they're not stupid and they're not evil. And this lady puts up her hand, God bless her, and she says, I think they're stupid and evil. <laughs> now, I didn't take it personally as a repudiation because it was a joke. I got it. You know, no big deal. And it, by the way, I don't care if anybody says anything to me. I'm not going to get offended, generally. Um, but here's what I thought, and here's the epiphany. When she said that, my mind went to... Seattle, because that's my hometown. 
My father was a college professor. My mother was, a, was an artist. What do you think their politics were? When that lady said that, she was talking about my family. And I took it personally at that moment. And that was a big flash for me. Why? Not because I disagree with the lady. I bet you I agree 90% on the politics of that lady, right? But because I love my family and they're not stupid and they're not evil. And I don't want a stranger to tell me that my loved ones are morally reprobate. And you shouldn't want that either. Quick, show of hands. How many of you love somebody with whom you disagree politically? It's 100%, except for those of you who aren't paying attention. But it's you too. OK. You want to know how to make things better in America? Stand up for the people you, to the people you agree with on behalf of people you disagree with. Look, that's what we do as Catholics, isn't it? That's what we do as a traditional religious minority. And that's what we've relied upon in this great country of people taking care of us, too. You want to bring the country back together? Stand up to the people that are expressing hate, even if you agree with them. Now, how? Because <laughs> that's the tricky part, is the, the, the how-to part of this whole equation. Um, it's not apparent in all situations, and it takes a lot of courage. But, but more than anything else, it takes just a, a, a few couple of quick ideas, as a matter of fact. So I'll, let me walk you through some ideas that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you for your consideration. To begin with, the problem that we have in the way that people talk to each other so hatefully is often described as one of political anger, isn't it? Everybody's so angry with each other. That's actually wrong. I have this friend, he teaches at the University of Washington. He's the world's leading expert on marital reconciliation. His name is John Gottman. He runs the Gottman Laboratory with his wife, Julie. They've brought thousands of couples that were on their way to divorce court back together. This guy's my hero. The basis of any stable good society is married love. True, in my view. And anybody who can make more married love and keep couples together and keep parents together taking care of their children, my hero. I love this guy. He's great. He's a visionary, actually. And, and John Gottman, he said something very interesting to me. He said, anger is actually not associated with separation and divorce, not correlated statistically with separation and divorce. Thank God I'm married to a Spaniard, as I told you before. It's like I've had 10,000 arguments over the past 30 years of my marriage. <laughs> no hint of separation or divorce, ever. It's, it's, it's forever. Anger isn't a problem. Why? Because anger says, I want to fix something. I'm invested in wanting to fix something. The problem in American politics is not anger. It's something much, much worse. It takes anger and it puts disgust on top of anger, which creates a noxious compound called contempt. Contempt, according to Arthur Schopenhauer, is the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another person. If you want a permanent enemy, show contempt. Contempt is what you show when you, you're mocking somebody else, when you dismiss somebody else, when you show any sign of disgust. Back to John Gottman. John Gottman has this thing in his laboratory. He'll get a couple together that's having a lot of marital discord, and he'll videotape the couple. He'll watch the videotape as they argue about something with the volume turned turn to zero, and he can tell within five seconds whether somebody will be divorced within five years with 97% accuracy. What's he looking for? Eye rolling. Eye rolling. The ultimate physical sign of contempt. It was like, ugh. you know, and having you know, lots of teenagers, I've seen my share of eye rolling, right? <laughs> but when it comes from your spouse, when it comes from a friend, when it comes from a colleague, when it comes from just somebody who owes you some amount of respect and consideration, you never forget it. You never, it's hard to forgive. That's how you make a permanent enemy, is by showing contempt. So here we are. Here we are in America. That's how everybody expresses themselves. And, and, and I don't have to tell you, almost all of you are on social media. Social media is a contempt machine. Twitter is contempt ink. It's where you talk to people as if they're all idiots. Say something even remotely controversial. I mean, it's funny. 
this is a problem in just in general in the internet age. I, I write for the New York Times and once a month. And as a conservative, it's not because I'm looking for friends. Trust me. I mean, it's a, and you know, my, my publisher, a guy named Arthur Salzberger, he takes me aside when I first start my column and he says, let me give you a piece of advice. And I said, yeah. He said, never read your comments afterward. And I said, why not? He said, because you, as a conservative, you could write a, a column called I Love Puppies and you'd be denounced as a fascist. <laughs> and sure enough, it's, a, it's just all contempt all the time. It's, you know, it's terrible. The problem is when somebody does that to you and is an identifiable person, you basically have a permanent enemy. And worse yet, when you do that to somebody else, you have an enemy. And I know you don't want to do it. Why do you do it? Because it's a habit. It's a habit. That's a habit. It's a habitual form of communication that we have with each other today. Okay. Now, all the... The, the, the most important brain science these days on the subject of habit formation and how to break habits, it's looking at a certain part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens uh, uh, reinforces habitual behavior for immediate rewards, bypassing the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain where you make your conscious thinking happen. In other words, you just reinforce something and do it over and over and over again. When you treat somebody with contempt and you have a habit of contempt, you're not thinking about it. You just heard something that you disagree with and roll your eyes. Done. You got to break that habit. How do you break that? If you, if you join me in wanting to fix the country, if you want to be the beginning of the solution to the problem, no matter what your politics, you must break that habit. How? How do you break that habit? Well, we know because of the new research on the nucleus accumbens that you actually, you can't just say don't do that because you're bypassing your conscious brain to begin with. You have to put something in place of the bad behavior, okay? You have to, I wanted to do this and so I did this. Back in the old days, when I, I made my living as a French horn player, as a professional musician for 12 years, and I had a terrible habit, I smoked cigarettes. I was an inveterate pack a day smoker and I, I didn't want to do that. It was, it smelled bad, it was expensive, it made my mother sad, it needed to stop, okay? So I had to put something else in, instead of smoking cigarettes. So I took up drinking. <laughs> no, um. <laughs> so what do you do when you're in the habit of contempt? This is, I was mulling this over. I was, you know, it, and and one, of the, one of the wisest people I know somebody I really love, a, a treasured friendship for me, and somebody I've been working with for six years is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Okay? We do a lot of public events together. We've written together in the New York Times. We're starting a book together. I'm going to see him next month in his home in Dharamsala in the Himalayan foothills at his monastery. I see him every year, uh, at least once. And uh, we were making a movie that's going to come out in March, next March. We've got this movie coming out. And we were shooting like this conference thing where we were having a structured conversation about compassion and love and how we could reflect these things in, in the economy, believe it or not. But between takes, I was thinking about this contempt issue. And just the two of us, and I said, Your Holiness, what should I do at the moment that I feel contempt for another person? And he said, practice warm-heartedness. And I said, you got anything else? Because <laughs> that sounds kind of weak to me. I mean, that's like, that sounds like a, an aphorism. That sounds like like a piece of advice you'd give somebody when you don't really want to give them something practical. But then I thought about it. Some of you know the story of the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is the leader of the Tibetan Buddhist people. Uh, he was exiled from his homeland in Lhasa in Tibet, which is part of the now, it was incorporated by the, by the Chinese in the 50s. He was kicked out as a teenager. He was poor, his people were pacifistic, there were only six million Tibetans. He led his people into exile to be gone and forgotten. Uh, in, in facing complete military aggression, okay? All right, the largest arm, standing army in the world against six million Buddhist uh, pacifists. No contest. And what did he do? Over the next 60 years, he became the single most respected religious figure in the world with warm-heartedness, with compassion, with loving kindness. See, Here's the point when I thought about this a little bit more. Contempt is actually for weak people. It's for reactive people. Contempt is what you do when you're not in control of yourself. You're sort of reacting like a snail when stimulated with an electrical prod. Warm-heartedness is for strong people because that's, that's what you do and it isn't what you want to do. But you know it's the right thing to do. Warm-heartedness is to be strong like the Dalai Lama. That, that changed my thinking a lot, right? It's important to remember. 
So then I asked him the really hard question, which is your holiness, how do I do that? How do I remember? <laughs> and then he gave me this great piece of advice that I want to give you. He said, remember a time when you accidentally expressed warm-heartedness instead of contempt and bring that memory back and relive it. So I went back to my little room. When I'm in Dharamsala, I have this little cell. When I'm, when I'm with the Dalai Lama, I have this cell, you know, to, to, to decorated with Tibetan paintings, and it's very beautiful, it's small, and, 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 I, and I went to think about it, to think, to dredge up a memory, and I had this memory, and I'm going to share it with you. It was the time when I accidentally, I'm not such a virtuous person, I accidentally answered contempt with warm-heartedness, and it totally changed a really bad situation. And it was back when I was still a college professor. I was teaching at Syracuse um, in 2006. I was a very happy person. Um, because being a college professor is really, literally the best life on earth. I was living in relative professorial obscurity. I was preparing my classes. I was writing my papers. I was writing books that nobody ever read because they were, you know, pretty boring. Um, but I thought they were kind of fun to write, and life was sweet. And then this thing happened to me. I wrote a book about charitable giving, about who gives to charity, who thinks they give to charity, and the difference between those two groups. And it was all charts and graphs and math and had a big mathematical appendix. And it was going to do the same thing that all my books did, which is nothing. It's going to sell a few hundred copies, maybe a few thousand if I got lucky. And it hit the news cycle in just the right way because it's something the president said. And this thing happened to me that happens to academics sometimes, which is that my book started selling hundreds of copies a day and my life changed. It was like the axis of the earth changed on me. And I was on TV suddenly, and I was on the radio, and, and you know, newspaper reporters were calling, and I didn't know, but literally, my life was never going to be the same again. And I, I'm giving all these interviews, and, and here's the weird part. I started hearing, because when you have a book that suddenly is a bestseller, people start to write to you, and they feel like they know you because they read your book, and they tell you very intimate details of their lives. You know, I, I, want you to tell me about, I want you to tell you about my grandma, stuff like that. And, or, you know, I hated your book, and let me tell you all the reasons I think you're a bad person. That's really weird that people reach out to you. And my email was easy to get. It was on the university website. <clears throat> okay, two weeks after the book comes out, I get an email from a guy in Texas. Dear Professor Brooks, you are a right-wing fraud, which is not a very promising way to start an email. But I, was, I kept reading, and here's what I noticed. It was 5,000 words long. It was going to take 20 minutes for me to read this email. But I'm game, and I'm reading through this email. <laughs> And here's what I realized. This guy is repudiating every single fact in my book in insulting detail. Like, you know, the columns in table 3.1 are reversed, you moron. You know, stuff like that, right? And <clears throat> so you're probably wondering what was going through my head as I'm reading this unbelievably detailed, insulting screed based on every detail in my book. You know what I was thinking the whole time I was reading it? He read my book. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> And I was filled with gratitude. Right, Patrick? It's just like, you can't believe it. <laughs> you can't believe it. You can't believe that I had written book after book and nobody read it and this guy read it. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell him what's on my heart. And so I sent him an email. I said, you're so-and-so. I know you hated the book and think I'm a stooge and I got it. But um, you, it, it took me two years to write that book and you read every word. And I'm filled with gratitude. Thank you. Send. <laughs> and then I go back to work. And I'm cleaning up a data set or doing something. And 15 minutes later, his response popped back up. And ding. And now I'm nervous, right? And what is he going to say? Because he's going to be really mad now, right? <clears throat> Open up his email. Dear Professor Brooks, next time you're in Dallas, if you want to get some dinner, give me a call. <laughs> What's up with that? <clears throat> the answer is, he treated me with contempt, and I accidentally answered him with warm-heartedness and gratitude. By the way, gratitude is the carrier of warm-heartedness. It's your secret weapon for you to express warm-heartedness. And it changed the relationship. It changed his heart a little bit, and it changed my heart a lot. And I remembered that, and, and the Dalai Lama said, that's it. That's it, because you saw that you can go out in the world that's full of contempt and full of hatred and full of disdain and full of mockery and full of sarcasm and full of Twitter, right? And you can, you can start trolling around looking for contempt. Why? Because every time somebody treats you with contempt, that's your opportunity to get happier and to make somebody else happier too. How often do you think that an attack is an opportunity? It is. It is. It absolutely is. And if you want to create a better world, 
That's how you do it. The enemy is contempt. The answer is warm-heartedness. Okay, now before I turn it over to you, because I know you've got classes and some you have to leave and I won't be offended. <clears throat> Let's review. There are lots of big problems. Big problems have solutions, but not thinking in old ways. <laughs> big problems have solutions when you think about them in new ways. To do that, you need to find your big moral epiphany. Mine are, if you want more dignity, make people needed. Everybody needs to be needed, number one. Number two, if you find contempt, it is your opportunity to change your heart and to start saving America by answering that contempt with warm-heartedness. If we just did those two things, if all of you did just those two things, think about all the interactions that between us we're gonna have in the next day, next week, next month, next year. If we become, as part of our apostolate, this kind of thing, forget your political differences. Let's make a world based on brotherhood and solidarity and unity and, and see what happens. <clears throat> Last thought, then over to you. My wife Esther and I, we have a retreat center near our house called Our Lady of Bethesda. It's run by the Legionaries of Christ. And we teach marriage prep there. Um, if any of you get married in, your, in our local area, maybe you'll be in my class. You'll get to hear what I think about how to have a happy marriage. Um, it's a different talk. <clears throat> and, in the marriage, here's the thing that I want to bring up about that. This, this retreat center is a very beautiful place. Um, not because it's so ornate. It's not like the basilica here. It's, it's just full of love. And there's a chapel there. And, and in the chapel, there's a sign. Really caught my eye. Sign over the door. But it's not the sign over the door when you're coming in. It's a sign over the door when you're going out. Out of the building, out in the parking lot. It's for parishioners. It's for mass goers to think about as they're leaving. You know what it says? You are now entering mission territory. <laughs> now, <laughs> think about that for you and for me. Imagine if we had that sign over this door. Imagine what we could do if we actually understood that our apostolate in a secular world is to see ourselves on a mission for warm heartedness and a mission to make people needed. If we do that, we have a fighting chance of being part of a better world starting today. So, so just, even though it's not there, I want you to imagine as you're leaving today, as you leave today, I'm praying for you because you are entering mission territory. God bless you. We have about uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, for questions. We have a tradition in the program, which is we invite our undergraduate students uh, to ask first question, and Jack will bring you uh, the microphone. Undergraduate with questions. Okay. I stand up, tell us who you are. Does he have to prove he's an undergraduate or something? <laughs> Definitely an undergraduate. Um, I am Tim Jaklich. I am a junior. Uh, and my question has to do with the public policy problem you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of talk now about how automation will be <clears throat> eliminating a lot of jobs in our economy, trucking, manufacturing, uh, in the next uh, 20 years, in a time when our economy m may be needing less workers in the capacities that they've worked for many, many years, how should we approach uh, that situation and make those people needed? Thank you, Tim. That's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, it is true that the, the pace of change in the modern economy like the pace of change has always been in the economy, is going to change the needs for human capital. It's going to change the needs for knowledge. It's going to change the needs for labor. It's just going to change what it expects of people. It's always been that way since you know, time immemorial, but especially sped up from the time of the Industrial Revolution. Okay? Everybody's very afraid of this because there are, in point of fact, three million professional drivers in America today. Most of that's going to go away. I mean, we can hold it back. I mean, we can have artificial laws that make it so that you can't have driverless cars and driverless trucks for a long time. But sooner or later, capitalism will out on that. You just can't, regulations are not going to win that one. Now, why should we be less worried about that? Because today in America, there are 7 million unfilled jobs. <laughs> That's the truth. Most of them are 
relatively skilled jobs, many of them, at least half of them, are blue-collar semi-skilled jobs. The problem that we have in this country is not that jobs are going away, is that we have a mismatch between skills and opportunities. And that's a, a lack of, of imagination. That's a, a moral problem in the way that we set up our education system. See, we don't think about people's labor supply and their human capital and their skills, and, and we especially don't think about them if they don't traditionally go to college. And so here's my appeal to all of you. Stop being classists. Start thinking about how people need skills no matter who they are. Stop thinking about college for all and start thinking about skills for all and skills changing all throughout life. Because that's important to human dignity. Really is. I mean, this whole idea that we've gotten in this country of if you don't go to college, you're going to be a loser, that's wrong. 25% of people with college degrees get jobs they didn't need college degrees to get. And half of them, at least, are in jobs that don't require any of the skills that they learned in college. 90% of high school seniors today, this year, say they're going to apply to college. 65% apply and matriculate. 32% will finish, and relatively few of them will lose, use and work any of the skills they got in college. That's a, that's a ridiculous situation. It's completely inefficient, and it's a crisis. And it's especially a crisis because we are marginalizing the human dignity, the sanctification of the ordinary work of people that don't require a college education. So what do we need? You know, the education reform effort of our time should be skills that change and opportunities to learn skills for all people that are outside of the traditional college experience. We can absolutely face this problem going forward without trying to block the ocean. We can see it as an opportunity for people if only we have the imagination and we need the imagination of you in this room starting with your moral proclivities toward people at every part of the income distribution, every part of the skills distribution, and especially your ideas on how we can radically revolutionize the American education system in the process. Thank you for that. Uh, hi, I'm Dominique. I'm a senior here. Um, so I would call myself a progressive, as you mm -hmm. might be able to tell from my hair color. Um, if I had hair, I'd be that color, too. So you know, one can never um, tell. And something that I notice a lot as a progressive is not just anger, but I think a lot of fear, especially when um, on Twitter, when progressives are confronted with members of the alt-right and they start talking about punching Nazis. It's not that they hate these people necessarily it's that they don't know what else could be the answer they're not convinced that compassion is the way to go right. um and as firmly as i believe that compassion and and warm hardness is the answer uh still these people aren't really convinced um that that's ever going to work so i guess what would you say to those people who don't think you know as much of a good idea as this is that it's just not practical yeah no i appreciate that a lot thank you dominique for that question. Um, a lot of our current culture is, in point of fact, motivated by fear. It, it absolutely is. Part, but there's, there's an insular quality to polarization where people don't, they silo themselves and they actually don't know. I mean, you know probably tons of conservative kids here on campus. But if you didn't, if you were to a, a, a university where there was where conservatives were really, really marginalized, you might only know left-wing kids. And at which point, all of your idea of conservatives would come from what your friends are saying, and none of it would be complimentary, and all of it would be kind of scary. Now, same thing for all of you kids. How many of you consider yourselves conservatives? Any of you consider yourselves conservatives? You all have liberal friends, and if you don't, you should, because you need to understand each other. The basis, Dominique, of your... You're, you, you committed yourself to compassion and warm-heartedness, and part of the reason is because you love some people who don't agree with you politically. That's your obligation, is to make friends outside of your silo, and in so doing, your fear will lessen. It's a fear of the other, when the other is foreign, when the other is scary, right? That, that's part of the deal. The other point is this, and, and this is really an empirical thing. I had this very interesting experience. I have this friend this guy I've done some stuff with, and his name is Hawk Newsom. If you ever heard of him, he's, he's the president of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York. And I got to know this guy because he, he shows up to crash a, the, a, something called the mother of all Trump rallies on the mall in Washington, D.C. I mean, this guy is, this guy is courageous. 
right? He shows up with like, 20 of his buddies from Black Lives Matter in this big Trump rally on the mall with his fist in the air and ready to fight, right? The head of the mother of all Trump rallies is a guy named Tommy Gunn. It's not his real name, but you know, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty pugilistic, you know? <laughs> and, and Tommy Gunn, he, for some whatever reason, some flash says to, says to Hawk Newsom, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, man, you come up here, I'm gonna give you two minutes from my stage to make your case, we'll just see. And Hawk Newsom gets up there and he says, I'm an American and I'm a Christian and in this country, when something's broken, you at least can stand up and say it's got to get fixed. And he winds up in two minutes getting this big ovation from the people because he made common cause. Now, here's my point about this. If you don't know anything about this, you think that the mother of all Trump rallies, which also included bikers for Trump, scary, right? Bikers for Trump, scary on his face, particularly if you're in an insular left-wing community. Or if, you're, if, you're, if you see Hawk Newsom with his hand in the air, the guy is six foot six. And he's, got, he's doing this, and you think, scary, right? If you don't know anything about Black Lives Matter or Greater New York or Hawk Newsom as a man, if you're insular and you never meet anybody, and yet, and yet, this magic happened, and Hawk Newsom winds up having his picture taken with these Bikers for Trump's kids afterward. I've had him on my podcast. He's a lovely guy. And it's just, we have everything in common that's important. And it's just the political stuff is the political stuff. We're, we're trying to work together to find a better America. And, and we're, we have different ideas about this, that, or the other thing. Who cares? The point is, when we think that there's no room for common ground, there actually usually is. But you have to be a missionary. You have to take some risks. You have to get out there. So Dominique, here's my, don't change your politics. We need you to hold your politics firm. You need to believe these things. And you gotta get out and make a bunch of friends and explain it and explain it with love and compassion and especially not to have fear. And if each one of, does that, each one of us does that, then suddenly it's not like, do you punch a Nazi? Do you not punch a Nazi? It becomes a, a meaningless conversation at that particular point because you just don't have time to be thinking about those things. It's a beautiful question. I appreciate it. Okay, let's open it up as now. <clears throat> um, it's a little crowded back here, so I won't stand, but I'm Carrie. I'm um, a 3L in the law school. Um, first of all, thanks for your talk. I thought it was really great, and I agree with um, most of it. My question, though, is the part where you talk about like need being the basis for dignity and all that thing. I'm wondering, not everybody responds to need in the same way. Like some people run away from it. Some people, you know, don't respond as you or I would. Give me so, an example. So like the proverbial, I guess. So my experience is mainly in like criminal prosecution. Yes. Um, so like you take the proverbial like deadbeat dad, for example, like what more like source of need than a child? And that doesn't always you know, kick in right. with that. So like, I guess what, it seems like a necessary thing, but not a sufficient mm. thing. So I'm just wondering if you had thoughts. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. Um, that's an interesting case because I'm doing a lot of work with my colleagues at AEI on criminal justice reform. And we're dealing with these, and part of the reason is because if you wanna do good, you gotta go to the hard places, right? I mean, the tendency is to go to all the easy cases. You know, let's find, you know, like I wanna give to charity and so I'm gonna find, you know, a service project in a, a country where this doesn't happen to be, have had economic growth for a long time or something like that, and I'm gonna help them build a church. That's great, it's great as far as it goes. But you wanna do the hard thing? is to go to the places that have had all of the advantages and it still hasn't worked out. And that's what you're dealing with. You're gonna be a criminal lawyer, you're gonna see sad things, you're gonna see hard things. You're gonna see not the unloved, but the unlovable. And the test of your moral character is gonna be teaching people to love the unlovable. One of the characteristics of people traditionally thought to be unlovable is that they're, they're, they're resistant to being needed. You give people things so that will, what you think are supposed to build up their human dignity and they take off, they'd be dead, right? That's the same thing as almost anybody who's, who's caught up in the criminal justice system today. But these are the biggest cases of actually how we have to be more creative in showing people that they are, in point of fact, necessary. Most Americans, by the way, they don't think that felons are, are we need felons. We exactly don't need felons, but that's totally wrong. Why? There are 23, you know this better than I do, 23 million Americans who have been in prison 
for major crimes and who are now walking around free. Which is great that they're walking around free because they paid their debts to society, right? 600,000 new ex-prisoners enter uh, the non-prisoner population every year in America, right? We actually need them. We cannot have 20, and by the way, the unemployment rate for those people, 70%. A 70% unemployment rate for 23 million Americans is catastrophic for our economy and a complete waste of human capital and terrible for communities and terrible for children and terrible for our souls. So what are we going to do to be more creative about helping people feel the need? It starts, you know what it starts with? It's actually changing attitudes about whether they really are needed, right? And how do you do that? Let me give you an example. I know this group called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program in Houston, Texas, and they're all about training people who are a year away from getting out of prison in entrepreneurial skills, such that they can create their own jobs to try to defeat the 70% unemployment problem. Turns out only 16% of them actually start their, their, their companies because their entrepreneurial skills have made them so necessary that they go out and get jobs anyway. And what that has done is it's helped these guys who are, I mean, these really are people at the margins. You know, we talk about the people who are the, like the, the Pope always talks about la gente a la periferia de la sociedad, the people at the periphery of society, right? These are people at the periphery of society, the most in America today. What are you going to do to help them understand that they are needed on that side, that's on the demand side, and on the supply side, making them more needed in the general population. That is a blessing that we can actually bring that will solve a real economic need. And it's in your hands. That's why you're a law student, isn't it? I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm going to criminal law, I'm going to Notre Dame, I'm going to criminal law, because that's where the money is. I bet that's not, that's not why you're doing it. Because you're into it, because you want to have this impact. Maybe, maybe that's what you're supposed to do. Crack that code and people's lives will change. Thank you. A couple more. Hi, thank you so much for talking, Mr. Brooks. I thought the lecture was very interesting. Uh, my name is Jackie O'Brien and I'm a junior. Um, one thing that I saw slightly contradictory is I have read an excerpt of your piece, The Art of Limited Government, mm. and there I saw you more so emphasizing social capital, neighbor helping neighbor, mm. uh, private charities helping individuals who are on the margins of society, whereas here, you were obviously emphasizing need. So I guess my question would be, how does social capital not reduce the dignity of the individual that the same way governmental aid does? Mm. You know, that's a good question because just because something is a private charity doesn't mean it's good. It's crazy, right? I mean, just because something is not administered by the government doesn't, it, it, you know, this is a, a big problem that we have is thinking that just, I mean, the government screwed up a lot of stuff for sure. So it's too easy for us to think, therefore everything the government touches is bad. Well, that's wrong. And so everything that's in the private sector is good. Well, that's also wrong. <laughs> the point is that there have been lots and lots of social capital organizations, community organizations, charitable organizations that have helped people and not made them necessary, that have done exactly the same things. Okay, so, so let's not do that. You know, the Roman Catholic Church has done that too much through Catholic charities. It's been, you know, solving the problem, giving the man the fish, giving the man the fish, giving the man the fish, <laughs> over and over again. Well, that's not what we do. That's not what we're supposed to do. There's nothing about private or public sector tax designation that suggests that we don't make the same moral errors. You're bringing up an important point. We should think about this in every area of our lives. And by the way, we should think about this as parents. We should be thinking about this as a university. <laughs> Universities can help people without making them needed as well. Any organization can do that. So let's not. Let's think more creatively about this in every area of life. Oh, actually, you're, you're, you're calling on, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. I made the fatal error as speaker of pointing at somebody. So that's right. Uh, hi, Dr. Brooks. My name is Christopher Scott. Um, I just graduated from the university this year, but currently working as a research assistant focused on Latin America, but also very interested in U.S. politics. Um, I think, first of all, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I think what you said about contempt for people who have different views really resonated with me because this is something I've been seeing more and more both on social media, as you mentioned, and as well as in my own family. So I think uh, 
When it comes to my politics, I consider myself a moderate, and I think a lot of that stems from the fact that my, my parents have very different political views. I think my dad, at least on economic issues, tends to be more conservative, whereas my mom tends to be more, you know, more liberal. And so I guess I'm the same way. It depends on the issue for me. But what I've been seeing, um, you know, especially since Trump was elected and since the, the run up to that, is you know there there are some very great divisions within our family to the point where we we almost can't talk about politics yeah. at all. I mean, whenever the family gets together, it's like make sure you don't mention abortion or tax cuts or Trump or <laughs> any of that. <laughs> um, so I guess you know what what's the best way you know to address to repair these kinds of divisions that you know, seem to have developed among, you know, many families in America today. Thank you for that. I appreciate that a lot. My, one of the, the first episode of, of the current season of my podcast is called Family and Friends. And the reason is because what you're describing is super, super common. Um, you know, the, it, the Gallup had a very interesting poll recently that showed that one in six Americans has broken ties with a family member or close friend over politics. Broken ties. This is not a question of going home for Thanksgiving and saying, don't talk to you know, Uncle Mike about politics or you know that he'll get drunk and ruin this whole thing. That's different. That's basically saying, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I mean, Dominique's got friends that she would, that's like if she's one of these people who say, I'm not going to talk to you anymore because your views on, on abortion, on your views on Trump, on your views on tax cuts, whatever. That's insane. It's not right. It's, it's morally uh, corrupt. For us to actually let these things, which are lower, or I mean, like I'm not saying, I have very strong views on abortion, I'm not saying that. But the point is that people disagree in this country. The point is persuading other people on the basis of goodwill, not walking away and saying that you're beyond help. That's actually un-American to do that. And so, so the one in six are a much greater case of this. How do we actually solve something like this? The way that you do is by going where you're not invited and saying things that people don't expect on the basis of love and compassion. Having, with complete courage, having these particular conversations starts with listening. It's funny, this guy John Gottman, the marriage counselor, I asked him to give me five tips for how to do this. And so in this new book, I'm gonna give, it is Marriage Counseling for America on how liberals and conservatives can talk to each other in a way where they can maintain relationships. So you'll see that, and, and, and I'll send you an advanced copy if you want, if you want to do that before this Thanksgiving. Um, and, 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 but the key thing is to, is to overwhelm the situation with the things that we agree on and the things that we both love. My brother and I are very different politically. My older brother and I are close, and he's, he's, he's extremely liberal, and, and I'm not. And the funny thing is that we actually don't talk about politics very much, not because we're trying to avoid politics, but because we kind of don't get to it. You know, we talk about our faith, and we talk about our kids, and we talk about the memory of our beloved parents, and we talk about books. It's funny. You know, we just don't, I mean, it's like Trump is so far down the line. It's that it doesn't, or, you know, the, the repayment of international debt or, you know, something. It's just, it's an esoteric topic to us. We just don't have enough time together to begin with. Swamp it with the matters of love and listen respectfully no matter what anybody thinks. And you can not only repair these relationships, but not become a statistic to become one of the one in six. By the way, there's one other thing that John Gottman tells me that I want to submit to you that I think is really beautiful. He shows that in relationships that are on the rocks, he, he has these rules of communication between spouses that if you want better uh, spousal relationship, you have to have a, a, a ratio of positive to negative comments. And so you have to say five loving positive things for every criticism. See, what he finds in, in couples that aren't getting along very well, that it's highly overweighted to criticism and negativity. <clears throat> so five criticisms or negative things for every positive thing, that wrecks relationships. So he says you have to literally count it up and ration your criticisms. And you have to think up nice stuff to say before you can get to your criticism. And he says it completely changes relationships. And I said, well, what about that on Twitter? He said, oh, yeah, for sure. If you're using Twitter and you're talking about public policy, you have to say five positive, beautiful, loving, compassionate tweets for everything that you say that could be interpreted as criticizing or as negative. Try it. Who knows? Might turn you into a different person. Thank, Thank you. you.